So what I'm going to talk about is a little brief summary of what I spoke earlier this morning. Um, but actually, I should say it follows very logically from what Janice spoke about. Um, I'm trained actually as a hard rock igneous isotope geochemist by, by, by actual training. And when I was at ANU, um, we did develop methods to do fine scale trace element geochemistry. And I was aware of the, the um, existence and aims of these very beautiful long coral cores and, and of the luminescent bands that um, Peter Eisd on actually Dave Barnes was involved in some of that work as well. And so I was sort of driven by curiosity to say, well, can we see a geochemical signal in these bands? Um, which actually got me started in some of this work, which I'm sure a lot of you heard me talk about. But um, just talking about stresses on corals, um, there's, there's many, um, some very local, such as explosions. Um, we have shipping accidents that can be quite severe. Um, and of course, we have oil rigs, I should say, that can um, uh, have accidents. And in, we've actually suffered such an event in Northwest uh, WA, which has been little reported, and, and, and it is an oversight. Um, and the effect of that is an area that I think we should look at much more carefully. There's a lot of coastal industries, especially along the Queensland coast. Uh, Crown of Thorns is actually a major phenomenon of that, um, and its relationship, what's causing it, and there's now some very good evidence that it may in fact be related to the extra nutrients that are coming into the inshore regions. That's work that's been recently done. And of course, we often have marina developments, um, not only in Queensland, but they're common in, in, all, in all the states. Uh, everyone wants to live in a nice, beautiful marina with go out to their boat. But this, in this case, at Port Hinchinbrook, that involved clearing mangroves. And there was acid runoff, for example, some other effects that, that resulted. But what I'm going to talk about um, today, oh, well, fishing, I, that goes without saying. Sorry, I forgot about that one. And that's a, obviously, that's um, a very important industry. It employs a lot of people. But it, 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 it can have significant effects if, for example, trawling is done near or on reef systems. But what I'm going to talk about today, sorry I jumped the gun, um, is about river flood plumes. And this is slightly image enhanced, but actually sh that shows a plume uh, coming from a river discharge. So the, the, the catchments of the Great Barrier, well, the, the Great Barrier Reef is an is a interesting system because it has very, very large river catchments. In fact, the largest river system in terms of flow is the Burdekin River. Most people don't realize this. It's got a huge catchment. I used to have a map. I didn't use it at the Royal Society, but you can put England on this, this map and the catchment of the, the Burdekin River is, is, is comparable to the UK. And also, of course, the next one, the Fitzroy, is also a very, very major catchment. And the interesting things is that the river, the Burdekin, for example, doesn't flow all the time. Often you can just walk across that river floor, um, especially in periods of drought. But when it does flow, it flows. It has a huge volume. And, and in fact, this uh, slide shows that you can get river heights up to 25 metres above the road level. It's just a horrendous event. And when that happens, you get these massive uh, flood plumes. Um, this is actually a river system. This, this actually shows the Lucinda jetty. You can see that. That's, that's part of the, the, the flood plumes, not from the Burdick, and this is the Herbert River. Um, Mike Kingsford took this picture. But you can see it's a really stark contrast. It forms a very strong boundary layer. It's low salinity water, rich in sediments. And those sediments are undergoing chemistry. They're discharging, they're desorbing their nutrients the, and some other trace elements. And the question I asked is, what's the effect of this on, on the reef? Well, it turns out we have um, uh, some traces to, do, to look at this effect, and barium is one of them. And if you look at near the river mouth, you find barium is quite high in concentration, and it gets lower as the salinity of the water um, uh, decreases. Is this a pointer? So as you change the salinity, the barium mix, mixes along more or less a straight line. So when we have events like a flood plume going out, and this is an Ames diagram, um, the, the, the event does go eventually right across uh, the inshore, the reef. I'll actually be talking about reefs much closer to shore because the signal is much stronger there. But nevertheless, this shows the, the trend of what's been, uh, what's been happening. Barium also has an interesting chemistry in that it's, it's, it has, it's on the same part of the periodic table as calcium and therefore goes directly into the calcium carbonate structure and is easily incorporated into the um, 
into the coral skeleton. I should point out we're not actually, these signals we're looking at dissolved barium coming off clay particles from the river. Uh, we're not actually directly measuring the particles themselves. And it's this unique geochemical feature that, that we're using. And I won't go over the cores, but this is, the core we have was one of the longest ones that Ames collected actually. Um, it shows these beautiful river luminescent bands. You can date this core exactly, and it goes all the way back to the 1500s. And so you can measure it week by week, um, continually back to that period. And so that's what uh, we did. And um, uh, it's quite interesting. We have Cook's, um, some of Cook's um, memorabilia from, from his expedition. And we can, in fact, pick out the exact point in time, 17, I have to remember the date now, um, 17, where is it, 1770. Up, up in there, we can pick the week that Cook sailed past this particular coral head. Um, and we can pick the date almost where he actually then eventually hit a reef, right? And then the ship was holed. So this is, um, um, so these, these are very high fidelity records. Um, I should point out this expedition probably was also funded, I, I gave this presentation at the Royal Society with this exact slide. And they said, oh, do you remember that we, the Royal Society actually funded Cook's expedition? So this is one of the, probably the first Europe, or the first English expedition to the Great Barrier Reef. It wasn't intended to, uh, to explore it in so much detail and, and crash into it, but nevertheless it is recorded as such and, and a lot of this material is, is actually at the Royal Society. Anyway, the interesting story as far as this goes, I've only shown part of this record back to 1750, but in fact the same sort of data goes back to about the 1650s. We have that, I should put that up. Um, so we extended this record backwards a few hundred years, and it's pretty boring uh, prior to about 1850. And then you see uh, the very first major event in 1870, which is, turns out to be the first major cyclone that came through um, the Burdekin catchment area after it had been um, settled and or, or, or grazing activities had started in that catchment. And there's also a long history in the, early 19, in the late 1800s of clearing timber and stuff around the catchments and actually using the timber to burn for fires to actually melt down things, get sh fat from animals and particular sheep that were dying off and so on. I won't, um, yeah, so the story was that they put a lot of sheep on the catchment, a lot of them didn't survive because of the spear grass poisoning, and they actually then melted them, they, they extracted the fat by, and cleared at the same time, cleared the, um, the around the, the river um, banks and so on. And cattle numbers increased dramatically. And what I've been able to show, I showed this slide earlier today, is that there's actually an amazingly close relationship between the cattle numbers and what happens um, in terms of the, what the coral is recording in terms of this barium signal, which is actually proportional to the sediment discharge. And we see events like, uh, I think 1981 was the period when Bob Hort, the election was held because that period, there'd been a major drought prior to that, and everyone maybe decided we should do something about something. <laughs> But I remember that as a very distinctive event because there was a minor flood, but the biggest sediment load that's been recorded going into the Great Barrier Reef occurred during that, um, during that period. And the breaking of the drought was, um, uh, the, that drought breaking flood was critical uh, to the whole um, system. So we're now continuing to gather this data so we can now use this to see what happens when um, as we try and improve the, the, the quality of the catchment and take other measures uh, to present, to keep the soil on the catchment. I'll just now finish off with a little brief issue. We've talked about flood plumes, um, this bleaching industry, um, and I'll just, I thought I'd show you, I'm now in WA, I'm in Perth, I've, and I'll show you some pictures I took of Ningaloo Reef, which I was so, this is on, these, these corals are amazing, and this is interesting because the the thing about the WA coast, it has no major rivers flowing into it. So these reefs occur within a few hundred metres of the shore. You can snorkel out, and it's because it borders a desert. And in fact, this, these may be the last refugia of, you know, we talk about, you know, this, this area seems to be the place where the corals are still doing very, very well. Um, and it does show what the coral reefs can do if they don't have to deal with the impacts of land runoff and, and so on. And, and in fact, we have a Brolis Islands, which is uh, famous for the Batavia wreck. And you can actually see the actual wreck where it went into the reef. But the corals are doing fine. And all you've got to worry about is the seals that swim around uh, by you at the same time. 
Um, so I, I've talked about local impacts, and I'm not going to talk about the details of how they affect reefs. They're, that's a fact. We'll be talking about that in our symposium. And of course, there's other impacts like global change. Um, so the basic moral to the story is, we sh although global climate change is happening, in many ways we can't, as individuals, do a lot about it. Maybe as a country we can, and hopefully globally action will be taken. But we, uh, we look after the, the, the globe's best coral reef systems. We're very fortunate to have that. And our responsibility is to make sure that the catchments and what we do on land uh, minimises any impacts on the on the Great Barrier, on, the, on our coral reef systems. So thank you very much.